Welcome everyone to the newly refreshed development and action webinar series. It was formerly known as the Knowledge Hub webinar series. To launch the series, the first webinar taking place today will be on the topic from Chennai to Coventry, a peace educator's journey into policy. My name is Eva and I'm the alumnus alumni relationship manager uh, with the CSE alumni team. And I am excited to welcome Commonwealth alumnus Kirti Jayakumar to present this webinar today. Kirti will speak to us about her experiences as an entrepreneur in the gender equality and peace education space. This webinar will address the CSE development theme of strengthening global peace, security, and governance. A bit of short introduction about Kirti. Kirti is a feminist researcher working in the area of women, peace and security, transitional justice, and feminist for foreign policy. She founded the uh, Gender Security Project, which she will speak about more in her uh, presentation. Um, one of the other interesting points to note is that Kirti herself taught herself to code and created a web and mobile application called Sahas. Um, this was developed to support survivors of gender-based uh, violence, which again, she will speak more briefly in her webinar presentation. Kirsi's areas of interest include gender studies, peace and conflict research, security studies, and international human rights and humanitarian law. I'm pleased to inform that Kirti is a 2018 Commonwealth Scholar from India. She completed her MA in Peace and Conflict Studies from Coventry University. I now hand over this presentation to Kirti to begin with her webinar. Uh, once again, if you do have any questions, please put them in the chat box and we will address them in the Q&A session after the presentation. Kirti, over to you and a big welcome from the CSC uh, team um, to present your webinar. Thank you so much, Ms. Eva. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. And thank you so much for setting time aside to listen to what I have to say and hopefully to also share your thoughts through questions and answers. As Ms. Eva kindly introduced me, my name is Kiti, and I was a Commonwealth Scholar for two years of my life when I studied at Coventry University, getting my master's degree in Peace and Conflict Studies. Uh, in today's conversation over the span of, an, of half an hour roughly, I would like to share a little bit about my experience, the work that I did before I went to Coventry, what changed for me because I went to Coventry and worked as a Commonwealth Scholar, sorry, studied as a Commonwealth Scholar, while also working at the same time, and what life looks like right now. But before I get into that, I also want to be very, very cautious and a little frank. Some parts of my story do involve experiences of violence. While I will not be graphic in my descriptions of violence, I also acknowledge that the mentions of particular forms of violence can have a triggering impact. So I would like to leave you with a link on chat. Please feel free to click that. It's a site in the process of being developed, but this page is fully functional. It has some really helpful healing resources that you can use to ground yourself if you feel triggered. And of course, the option is always around for you to step away from your screen. And maybe you could let Miss Eva know that you're stepping away from the screen so she can leave you a chat message to let you know when the triggering share is over. And I would also love to hear your questions. I know that some of you have sent in questions in advance. I'm going to try to answer as many of them through the course of my presentation, but please keep your questions coming in through chat and would love to have a conversation with each of you. Right, so my name is Kiti, as I said, and I have a bit of a mixed bag of experience that touches upon peace and conflict in one way or another. So what we're going to talk about today, as I just said a couple of minutes ago, we're going to start with a little bit about my life and my work, what the Commonwealth Scholarship did and meant for me, a few times when I was challenged and I tripped along the way, and what it really looked like to shift from being a peace educator at the grassroots level to working towards informing policy change. 
And before I proceed, I also want to let you know that this is a unique journey, which is perhaps tied to my own lived experience. So while some of these things may land for some of you, some of these things may not. I want to deeply acknowledge the fact that we all represent different backgrounds. And I want to humbly acknowledge that while I may have some lived experiences, it may not overlap with yours. Um, regardless, I hope you find something that you can take home through today's conversation. Right. So here's what my journey looked like. And I did talk about a mixed bag. So there you see a tiny bit of confusing presentations visually. But I started my journey in the field of law. And the story of that actually goes all the way back to when I was in ninth grade. My school hosted the first model United Nations for the first time in my city. And I live in a city called Chennai, which is all the way in the south of India, um, which is known to be one of the more conservative cities in the country. Now, at the time, Model United Nations was unheard of. It was remarkable, it was unique, and we were suddenly talking about world affairs. And that caught my fancy tremendously. I really wanted a career in the humanitarian and political affairs side. But I didn't know how I would go about getting that because at the time in India, the one route you had open to you was to choose a degree in political science. But my parents would have none of it. They wanted me to be a professional, at least be able to qualify myself as a lawyer, because my father and his brothers were all lawyers, and in their mind, I would have a plan B. So I went ahead to law school. I studied for five years. So in India, if you're not familiar, we have a five-year integrated law degree, which actually lets you graduate with a Bachelor of Arts and a Bachelor of Law at the same time. Now, over the course of my five years at law school, I was exposed to so many different things, including several forms of discrimination and violence because I was a girl and because of the ethnicity I belonged to. At some point in my journey, I was beaten up by people in my class and my seniors and left at the side of the street with a broken nose and feeling disoriented. And that unfortunately mentally made me switch gears out of the idea of being a lawyer because here were my classmates also studying to do justice, also studying in the belief that the law is a way to make people treat each other respectfully. But they were busy peddling violence without giving me a chance to be heard simply because of certain parts of my identity that didn't land well for them. And that was intensely uncomfortable for me because it meant that I was not acceptable and I was not worthy of inclusion in a space that I counted on as safe. But as I would see much later, it set me up for a massive life journey ahead. Not necessarily that I would have had to go through it to get to that point, but just that it opened my eyes to the fact that violence has been normalized across the world. So I went through the rest of law school, determined that I wouldn't go before a court of law to litigate because I didn't have a deep interest in it, nor did I find myself gravitating towards giving it a shot. When I graduated, the first thing I chose to do at the time was to enroll to be a UN online volunteer. I was too young to register or enroll to be a UN volunteer, which meant that field operations were outside of reach for me. And I was a bit too old at the time to take on a civil services examination. So I didn't have any other path open up before me to take on a humanitarian career. When I joined on as an online volunteer with the United Nations, I had the opportunity to work with several nonprofits, UN agencies and subsidiary bodies of the United Nations. And the projects I worked on were so varied. I got to deal with water related issues, sanitation issues, healthcare, research on producing maternal briefs in terms of briefs for mothers rather on maternal health rights, on sexual and reproductive health rights. And I also got to do a lot of research specific to the laws of countries around the discrimination that women faced. Wherever I went, no matter where it was, which unit at the UN I worked with as a volunteer or which nonprofit I engaged with. One thing that kept standing out to me was the fact that women were constantly facing violence. In some countries that violence took on a very ghastly form, female genital mutilation, child marriage. And in some countries, the violence took on a more microaggression form, which didn't seem visible to the eye, not providing equal pay for equal work preventing women from accessing opportunities and preventing women from leading their full lives. Wherever I went, whether it was in my own city, in my own country or outside of it, these narratives continued to challenge me and sowed a seed inside my head. A world that is so deeply violent 
is also a world that is so deeply gender inequal. At this point, and I am going to share a bit of a triggering incident. Um, so again, like I would like to remind you, please feel free to dip into the resource if you feel a bit challenged. At this point, on the 16th of December, 2012, there was a significant incident that happened in India and it shattered the minds of so many people in my country. A young woman was brutally gang raped in the nation's capital. Now this incident opened up the floodgates for what we now know as the third wave of feminist movement, where women across the countries and country and even beyond came together to really rally for women's rights. It was shocking. It was something nobody had read about in so much uh, candid portrayal. And it was something that really shook the conscience of the entire nation. But what also followed this incident was several women much like myself, coming out with their own stories, their own experiences and their own challenges. It was around this time that I came out with my own story of facing 13 years of sexual abuse as a child, of facing bullying and racist violence and casteist violence, and oftentimes at the receiving end of violence because of my identity. And having been at the receiving end of this form of violence, one of the biggest things that I took away was that somehow I was at fault. And that kind of a mindset automatically silenced me and made me believe that I couldn't speak up or speak out about anything that happened to me. But that incident, the incident that happened on the 16th of December, 2012, a good 10 years ago nearly, shook me up and opened up a story that I had kept inside for years together. Now, when I shared my story, two really powerful things happened. One, I got to be able to find the closure and the sense of peace I wanted for several years. And two, I was able to encourage other people who had faced similar realities to also release themselves from what held them back. But by the end of this journey, after having shared my story, I realized that the power of articulating, the power of being your true vulnerable self before other people is unmatched. And that set me up for my journey as a social entrepreneur, where I had the opportunity to take this model of storytelling to schools, colleges, universities, workplaces around me, and then soon beyond me, in order to get more people to really understand that all it takes to shift the mindset is to start by acknowledging that everyone has a story. And some of those stories are the consequence of somebody's choice to be violent. Now, as a social entrepreneur, on the 5th of June in 2013, I set up my first nonprofit, which was called the Red Elephant Foundation. Now the Red Elephant Foundation was dedicated to telling stories, using peace education, and driving home the deep message of gender equality. We called ourselves the Red Elephant simply because we wanted to paint the elephant in the room red and force people to sit up and take notice of issues they wouldn't otherwise talk about. And now this journey that started in 2013 soon became a massive force with volunteers joining from all over the world. And at one point in the journey, and I'm still astounded by how this happened, I had 179 volunteers supporting to take this vision on the ground wherever they were in the world. Now, as a social entrepreneur, one of the biggest questions I'm asked is what are the challenges women face in being part of the business industry and being part of the world of um, entrepreneurship? And to me, I think this is also a challenge that continues to date, which is accessing the kind of resources that men automatically have because of the availability of networks and privileges. Now, in several countries, especially in my country, there is already a patriarchal notion prevailing where the assumption is that men are the dominant, men are the basic norm, and anybody that doesn't fit into that identity of cishet men is automatically part of the periphery. So to sit inside a boardroom where I'm the only woman in a room full of men in suits, to be taken seriously, to receive support in the form of funding or even opened up networks has often been the biggest challenge. When I ran the Red Elephant Foundation, I worked on a shoestring budget and part of that shoestring budget really came from my funding sources of my own, money that I had earned and saved, simply because there weren't enough resources that I could access as a young woman in my country trying to make a change. 
The piece about social entrepreneurship is if yours is not typically a business model, it's not typically producing something that's economy worthy, it's a bit more tricky to actually get funding. Things are changing, which is a really great thing to speak about, but at the time, it was super tricky to get to that point. So when we worked with the Red Elephant Foundation at the time, we conducted workshops at schools, we conducted workshops for parents of children and teachers of children at their schools, and also at workplaces. And we strive to shift the mindset towards gender equality by normalizing the human in every individual and not allowing room for the division of human beings on any basis of discrimination. In this process, one of the tools that I created at the time and I'm really, really excited about is called the Saruki Chatbot. Now we called it Saruki simply because it was a portmanteau of the names of two of my best friends. So we'll leave that aside for now. But the chatbot really worked as a conversational piece for users on Facebook to engage and to indulge in some amount of peace education on a daily basis. And one of the things we created as part of this is the compassion footprint quiz, a short quiz of 11 questions with yes, no, or maybe answers that asked you about your actions for the day and asked you to reflect on where you were in terms of what you chose to do or didn't do and the consequences it produced. Now, both of these were a roaring success. Unfortunately, the code for the chatbot fell through, and so we're in the process of reconstructing and restoring parts of it, but the Compassion Footprint quiz remains online. If you'd like to check it out, I will make sure to add a link before we close out for it. So from the Red Elephant Foundation, my work as a peace educator also opened up a whole new avenue of trust building in a city that did not have too many resources at the time. So when parents would see me talking to their children about gender equality, when communities used to see me asking for people to dismantle belief systems that worked for inequality and against equality, I built a sense of trust in a lot of people who reached out to me when they faced violence, sometimes asking for help, sometimes asking for advice. And my law degree came in super handy at this time because I was able to offer advice to them whenever they needed it. It was at this time when I realized a very pivotal incident actually catalyzed this, where a friend of mine was trying to reach me from a country abroad where she was living, simply because she had faced domestic violence at the hands of her husband and was desperately trying to leave her house. But because she had never lived abroad before being married off to him and carted abroad, she didn't know what to do or where to go. Now, this friend of mine had left me close to 16 missed calls and 31 texts on WhatsApp, and it really opened my eyes to the fact that somebody could be in distress, try to reach somebody they trust, and not find that resource when they most need it. And I realized that tech could be a powerful stand-in for a person you trust simply because accessing them across time and space may be tricky, but a tech-based tool is available at the push of a button. So at this point, I decided that I would create an app for survivors of gender-based violence. Now, the journey originally began as an idea. I wanted to have somebody who would come in and code the app and help me work through creating it. But again, I did tell you about a shoestring budget that relied on my savings, so there wasn't much money. I couldn't pay people to code my app, and those that chose to do it voluntarily often had to choose between doing my project voluntarily and a paid project that would give them enough way to further their business. So when I couldn't get somebody to code it for me, I decided that I would have to do it myself. This was my vision. This was my dream. I was going to do it. But if you've been paying attention, you also know that I'm a lawyer. I have no information or understanding of computer technology or coding or any of it. So the desperate need to want to create this tech tool made me look up online and learn coding all by myself. Now, I have to be very honest with you. If you ask me anything about coding right now, I will draw a blank because it isn't a subject I kept in touch with, not a subject that I learned in an organic way. I learned it just to create the app. Over a span of a month, I cried through the process. I pulled my hair through the process. I was yelling at my family in the process. I was dreaming in HTML code. But somehow, I hope or crook, that app was done by the end of a month. And at this point, I want to draw attention to a really amazing organization called World Pulse that supported me through mentorship and access to communities of users who could give me feedback on the app with every stage of development. Now, this app has supported over 40,000 survivors across the world. And when I say supported, it means that people have found resources on the app. 
that they need in the here and now to support themselves or somebody they love or cared for. In this journey, we also got to understand the role of a third person who is witnessing violence or is aware of violence and can intervene in a situation to really shift the outcome a bit. Bystanders, as we know them. Instead of being passive, observing an incident of violence and saying to themselves, hmm, that isn't my problem, we wanted to shift people into a mindset where they step up to help as the norm instead of as the exception. So with that, we created a curriculum, a training curriculum. And when I say we, I mean me and my friends who chose to be volunteers for this cause as well. We created a curriculum for bystander intervention and trained 7,000 people, both online and offline. Now, during the COVID pandemic, especially right when it began, violence spikes were seen across the world. Domestic and other forms of gender-based violence had increased drastically because people were forced to hole up in houses with perpetrators, abusers, and people who became abusers overnight because of their circumstances. During this time, both the training and the app in itself had been very, very active to support as many survivors as possible. Now, when I tell you 40,000 survivors, I'm also giving you a very approximate figure because the app itself does not gather any data. What we do have is people writing back to us, either in the form of an email or in the form of a message on my social media, or even just a message that's available through somebody else to let us know that they use the app, found help, and got out of a dangerous situation. So here I was, a social entrepreneur, building an app, and then arriving at a pivotal point in my journey where an opportunity would land in my email in the form of a mailing list for an organization that I was subscribed to, advertising the Commonwealth Scholarship for Distance Education. Now, it's always been my dream to pursue a master's degree. In 2010, I got into Oxford University, but I wasn't able to afford the education and I had to give it up. A, a decision I regretted at the time, but not now after having gone through this journey as a Commonwealth scholar. So this was a very, very big dream, even to just think about giving it a shot. I applied for it. I got into Coventry University to pursue my master's. Now, Coventry let me know that the Commonwealth Scholarships for Distance Learning was available, and their course, as it happened to be, was a blended learning program, which worked for me because I could still study and could pay my way through studying without having to lose a lot of my savings in the process. So I applied for the Commonwealth Scholarship, and as luck would have it, I made it. Now, in my time at Coventry, and I got in in 2018, I had the best of both worlds, of being able to work here in Chennai, and of being able to function while I was still a student at Coventry, making my trips to the UK for two week sprints at a time, and coming back home to complete the rest of my degree. But what the Coventry program would then set me out to do was drastically different. It was incredible simply because I was beginning to learn about things that I hadn't already learned or had access to in a very real sense, not just theory. I wasn't just reading about the academics, but I was also thinking about the academics that I was quoting and citing. It struck me that almost all of the folks I was quoting and citing and referencing when I talked about women, peace and security in my papers were actually people from the global north and very often men. It shocked me that I couldn't find a lot of women who looked like me. I couldn't find a lot of non-binary people who came from my side of the world. And I realized that somewhere down the line, it had to be something to do with a gap. Not that there isn't anybody doing this work where we are down here in the global south, but that these people aren't having the platform to really create meaningful waves with those pieces of work. Academics were being heard, but were they as many in number? and I would discover it wasn't necessarily the case. So at this time, my exposure to women, peace and security also opened up my understanding to something called feminist foreign policy, which Sweden had first adopted, quote unquote, first adopted in 2014. But as I, was, I would investigate and dig deeper and begin to read and learn, I would also come to understand that feminist foreign policy has been practiced by women across the world and the global south right from resisting colonial, colonialism and colonial rule to making inroads in calling for their indigenous rights to be asserted. In presenting these rights, in questioning authorities that took away their right to sovereignty over their lands, a lot of these women were practicing feminist foreign policy, but they hadn't used the hashtag or the name that has now become so prominent. 
Now, both of these set me up for a small change in gears. And as it would have it, the COVID-19 pandemic decided that my NGO, my nonprofit here, couldn't continue in the same strain. So I had to close that down and a new avenue had opened up for me in the form of women, peace and security and feminist foreign policy. So when I switched gears, it coincided with so much that was happening in the world. There was a pandemic. There was no way to run business as we knew it. There were so many things challenging us in our everyday life, from our health to the way we handled our savings to the way we even thought about life in the future as it would be. And it was in this time that my pandemic baby, as I call it, the Gender Security Project was born. Now through the Gender Security Project, I wanted to learn different ways to action what the grassroots had taught me. Working at the grassroots had also taught me that while we can have a law at the top level, while we can have a treaty at the top level, while we can have countries deliberating in the Security Council for the, of the UN, for example, what is really translating to ground and what is preventing that translation from happening effectively on ground? So at this point, I want to also establish uh, two really interesting things that also tie into questions that came up. One question that came up was how I dealt with the glass ceiling. And another question came up with rallying support. And I want to answer both these before I proceed. No matter what business you choose to do, whether it's a for-profit, a non-profit, or a social entrepreneurship, or pretty much anything in the sun, you are going to be up against a systemic barrier. Personally, for me, the idea of a glass ceiling and a woman, woman shattering that feels uncomfortable because there's always somebody on whom the shattered pieces of glass will fall. I prefer a more intersectional approach, which is to acknowledge the fact that women do leadership in women's ways, in feminist ways that are not limited to patriarchy's idea of women or feminism. It's about inclusiveness. It's about intersectionality. It's about acknowledging the fact that women or non-binary people do not have to become purveyors of the patriarchy to be leaders. It's about acknowledging that opportunities are for the taking and that anybody gatekeeping those opportunities must be questioned. So at this point, rallying support became a significant route for me, simply because reaching out to like-minded individuals opens up avenues that nobody can estimate enough of. When you find a like-minded ally who is willing, who's willing to open doors for you, who's willing to hold space for you, and who's willing to pass the mic and shine the spotlight on you, you make an effort to pass that on. And in passing on, you build a whole community that is willing to see the vision of change that you have in your mind and also bring it alive through the collective energy and wisdom that they individually bring to the table. Rallying support for me looks like making tables longer and fences shorter and perhaps even destroying the fences altogether so that every individual that is affected by what may be a policy, a law, a treaty, or even a decision at the international level will have a say in determining that outcome. So creating the gender security project at this point, some people called it foolish. Some people said it was the silliest thing one would do during a pandemic where everybody's trying to save money. And still more where everybody's focusing on COVID-19 and issues like feminist foreign policy may not receive the traction it should. But I also firmly believe that there is no time too early, no time too late. There is good work that must be done. We start when we start. And we start where the shoe pinches. So if it hurts enough, we start right away. So with the Gender Security Project, we work specifically on the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, Feminist Foreign Policy, and the documentation of conflict-related conflict sexual violence. We also take a deep dive into the larger ethos of including women in positions of peace, in positions of peacemaking, and in positions of mediation, both at the grassroots and at the international level, through dedicated training programs that will be rolled out very soon. We piloted some of these programs with great success. Now within the WTS agenda, within the ambit of feminist foreign policy and within documenting conflict related sexual violence, one of the significant things we've understood is that women do not need to be taught to do peace. Non-binary individuals do not need to be educated to do and be peace. A lot of their energies have been diverted to fighting the patriarchy, but their engagement in peace and non uh, violent movements have often been tokenized, have often been reduced to representation through a quota. And we wanted to shift the needle on that a bit. So the idea that we follow here is to amplify the voices of women across the global south, women who question systemic and structural violence to women who fight the yoke of conflict that is imposed on their countries, 
on their people and on their bodies. So in order to do this, we curate thought pieces that are rooted in the majority world, primarily from women and non-binary persons, who call for a renewed understanding of what a world without war can look like. And this has led us down some very interesting places. Last year in March, as part of the Commission on the Status of Women, we got to participate and host two side events. Now the NGO CSW, as it is known, the Commission on the Status of Women, is an annual event where nonprofit organizations from all over the world come together to curate meaningful events that continue the dialogue in the women's movement. At these events, we talked about feminist foreign policy and drew attention to the need for more states in the world to adopt feminist foreign policies. I was also invited by the president of the UN General Assembly at the time, Volkan Borskir, to deliver a specific address that would speak about preventing sexual violence in armed conflict contexts and offer perspectives on what may possibly be useful solutions. In this time, I also got to join the W7 or the Women's 7, which is an ancillary process to the G7, in order to offer adversary support towards building peaceful policies for the future. We've also, as an organization, made inroads into two different spaces. One, feminist foreign policy through other means instead of just writing, where we produced a short documentary series. I'll make sure to drop a link for you in the chat before we close out, if you'd like to watch it. And this series curates voices of women from the global south, explaining what feminist foreign policy is by going beyond theory and situating lived experiences from the global south. We've also made inroads into feminist astropolitics, which is a very interesting line to look at space policy, space security, and space law, and include a feminist way of thinking on how we use space and share outer space with all of humankind. This is a relatively new area, so I don't have too many examples to share with you, but our idea is largely centered on looking at the word peaceful uses of outer space as a common heritage for humankind in feminist ways and in intersectionally inclusive ways. Now, the Gender Security Project continues to run on a shoestring budget, but we've gotten a bit wiser. We've come up with a business model this time. We want to offer trainings. We want to offer resources that we can put a price on for those that are able to afford it so that those that cannot afford it are able to receive at least some of these deliverables for free. At one point, because of the pandemic, I went completely teamless. I was sick at one point, and we had to close down operations temporarily as well. And these challenges, as it will continue to happen in the future, have also been a shot in the arm to help us understand what organizations could look like, how we can reinvent the idea of an organization, how we can really look at ways of imagining a future where organizations can sustain themselves, even if those that are running it are out of the running for a while. Now in this journey, yes, it does look very glossy. It does look quite interesting. And it looks like all the highlights and milestones are present, but there were challenges as well. It's hard to be able to work and study at the same time. While I was studying, I did have deadlines to turn in my term papers. I had a dissertation to finish while I was also helping my family out when it was a financial crunch during the pandemic. It's interesting to do your degree through the pandemic as well. It's not been an easy experience. It came with its own challenges because you had to do research relying exclusively on the internet or on the library system that's digital from your university, which means you have fewer resources as, as well. Regardless, the one thing that the Commonwealth Scholarship and the university that I studied in Coventry gave to me was a sense of deep support. My fellow members who, who were part of my cohort continued to inform my way of looking at the world. The blended learning module helped me learn laterally because I was also learning from my colleagues and part of fellow classmates who came from different experiences in their own journeys, who presented different examples to view the same ways in which the laws were presented to us, or the policies were presented to us, or even theory was presented to us. More than anything else, the Commonwealth in itself has been an extremely empowering journey to take as a scholar, simply because of the tricky ways in which the world navigates the future. And at this point, the wisdom that you get from your community, from whether that's the alumni you engage with or in scholarship participants that you engage with, you gain so much that helps shape you as a well-rounded human being. And these are memories that I will intensely always hold on to and always carry with me no matter where I go. So that's been 30 minutes of you listening to me. Um, I'm going to take a pause and see if we have any questions and would also like to see if 
anybody wants follow-up clarification, the links before I leave the session, I will make sure to drop me in chat. Thank you so much, Kizbi, for the wonderful presentation. Um, you have provided great insights on you know, your work on um, for, for survivors of uh, gender-based violence um, and how they have received support, uh, how you have received support from volunteers and also um, how you worked on a shoestring budget on various projects throughout your career. Um, your eagerness on um, you know, learning about the coding uh, process to develop an app for gender-based violence survivors and uh, then on leading to support 40,000 survivors is commendable. Um, thank you for sharing that information and also thank you for talking about your challenges that you have faced um, in your career, in your life and how you have overcome these over the years um, and the wonderful opportunities that you have received um, such as uh, speaking at the UN General Assembly. I'm sure the participants today have, um, you know, learned uh, a lot from your presentation and feel inspired by it. So thank you so much. Um, I would now like to open the Q&A session um, for our participants. Um, I do see a uh, hands up from one of the participants. So I would like to, um, if you are comfortable, Adama, I would like to invite you to unmute yourself and ask your question to our speaker, Kirsi. Um, and as mentioned earlier, we do have a list of questions that we have received in advance. So thank you so much for sending in your questions to the registration form. We will try our best to pull them up for our speaker uh, to address the questions that have come. So um, thank you so much. And um, Kirti, just to confirm, we can see the presentation slide. Um, I hope everyone can see the presentation slide. It's on the Q&A slide at the moment. If you're unable to see the slide, please can you let us know in the chat box. Uh, but let's go ahead with the question and answer session. Um, Adama, would you like to uh, go ahead and ask your question? Yes, please. Um, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much um, for this wonderful presentation, although I missed some part of it. Um, but I'd like to commend you for a um, really job well done. Um, so I'm a community um, um, community volunteer. I am not really active in, per se, in the feminist world, but um, in my country where I come from, there has been a lot of um, incidences of gender-based violence. And we've I've come across very active um, ad, um, advocates of them. So um, I'm not sure if such initiatives can be replicated back home, if if possible, because um, I enjoy voluntary works and um, it's a continuous process. Um, even when I get back home, um, despite doing my community health voluntary jobs, we might involve work with these organizations, women-led organizations that are really active with this whole agenda. So I want to know quick answers, how to go about replicating these things back home in the Gambia. Thank you. Thank you so much for your question, Adama. And thank you so much for also sharing a bit about the context, because it really helps me understand exactly what might be appropriate. Now, if you're looking at replicating a solution, I would start with one of three routes. One is either studying the solution by seeing whether it relates to the community that I am from, because sometimes a solution that works beautifully in the United States or the UK may, may be completely out of sorts, say, in India. So you want to start by acknowledging that we're coming from different places. So you want to see if what looks like a solution there can speak to the problem we want to answer. So that's one possible option. The other piece is to have a conversation with the people who are running the solution, whatever in the world that you feel is useful for your community and really sort of understand what the genesis of that was. Why was that organization or that actor or that agent under the impression that that solution could be an answer? And then to try to talk about the problem you want to solve in your community 
and then see if they have some advice on what pieces of their solution can work in your community. That's another starting point. And a third starting point, and this is my personal favorite, is to really listen to the people in your community. What are they saying? What do they want? What do they think they would use? For example, if you created an app, but your community is not interested in using apps, so it is not comfortable using um, an app, or maybe thinks that it takes too much time to open and access an app, then you probably want to figure out what that solution can look like locally. Uh, for example, when, in, when I started out, I knew that the community I was going to reach out to was the community that was using smartphones. Uh, because when I went about asking women in my mother's generation, more women said, oh, I don't want to use another app than women who said, yes, I will use an app. So you want to understand exactly what your community wants and then try to figure out whether what you have in mind can work for that. If not, have a think with them and then refine that solution so it really meets the problem midway. I hope that answered your question. Yes, thank you. Of course. Thank you so much, Alamu, for asking your question. Um, please feel free to send in your questions for Kirti in the chat box. Meanwhile, I will ask Kirti the, one of the, uh, a question that one of the attendees have asked through the registration form. So Kirti, the question is, um, how did you manage to transform your research output into policy actions and practice to solve developmental challenges in your country, considering the selfish interest of policymakers in policy formulation and implementation in most development, developing democracy. Thank you so much for bumping that question up on my radar, Ms. Eva. I hoped to answer it in my presentation, but I self-censored because of the time. But what I wanna share here is that this is an ongoing endeavor. I don't have an answer to tell you that this is my research output and this is the policy outcome in the here and now because policy change takes longer than a mindset change. And so the route to a policy change is really facilitating that mindset change. So some of the things that I have seen happen at the grassroots and without getting into too much detail because I don't have the consent of the individuals in question is the invocation of education for people occupying high positions in the judiciary. Um, occupying high positions and roles in the executive and the legislature, where a conversation with a government official opened up avenues for them to bring in people to train their communities on gender sensitivity, I'm sorry, gender sensitization and gender equality and intersectionality. And you see these things as happening in a bit of a, an accretion, not something that happens at one size fits all. And it's a very ongoing activity. But the one thing I will definitely say is that we do not have a firm grip of converting what looks like very theoretical research into very practical action. So I like to call myself a pracademic because I wanna be able to bridge the two in one way or another to translate what somebody sitting in a room with books is able to see that somebody out in the field is perhaps not able to relate to just yet. And so try to marry those two worlds to really make action possible. As for selfish policymakers, well, you're always going to encounter that. And there will always be somebody in a position of power, whether it's a classroom, a workplace, or a country's government, who wants to hold on to that power, who wants to hold on to that position, and is not going to be willing to give it to you or even share it with you. But the piece I like about engaging with these individuals is to create a small doubt in their minds about holding that power. Don't try to convince anyone. The more you try to convince a person, the more defensive they become. But then if you just ask them, really, where can I find more on this? And then they realize they are spouting what is patently nonsense. They begin to think for themselves. So don't look at breaking the brick wall. Just make a hole in the dam and let the water leak by itself. I love the term pracademic. It makes so much sense. And within the development sector, I know that be it policy makers or you know people who are creating policies or development professionals um i think one of the key point is to look at a bottom to top approach rather than you know top to bottom approach and knowing or telling people what they feel should happen or, or you know the change that they feel should take place within the community without asking the people themselves so that's a really good point that you have made that you know that's something that everyone can take from uh, in terms of policy making. Thank you so much for responding to that question. Um, 
the next question is um in the space that you are currently working are you able to have any kind of male involvement within your activities that's a really great question thank you so much to the person who asked this and thank you also again for reminding me of this question diva now the piece about male activism towards gender equality is often underrated many people don't really talk about it as much as they should now gender inequality isn't just women's problems isn't just non binary people's problems um and if we were to look at it as problems of women and non binary people alone we're imposing a massive burden of emotional labor on women and non binary people to undo something that was done to them on no account of anything they did to deserve it they simply don't deserve it so if we want to look at a world that is peaceful everybody has to be involved in making that world possible a world cannot be peaceful if only half of it is envisioning a vision for peace and is trying to achieve it now the first piece about engaging men is to acknowledge that they are stakeholders in that future vision of peace You see, patriarchy privileges men on the one side of it, but also dehumanizes men. It makes men bereft of emotions. It takes men out of being able to pursue their futures and their dreams as they want, and it also prevents men from having full, rich lives because they have to align with the cookie cutter mold that the patriarchy has made for them. But if men can see that there's a future that's beyond patriarchy. there is beauty in sharing power and there's beauty in bringing in voices that they have silenced for generations then that's huge that's a massive shift and the needle automatically converts to being one of building that peace as a norm rather than relying on violence so i definitely believe men must be part of this one way or another amazing answer amazing response to the question thank you so much um I do see a hand up um, amongst one of our participants, but I would like to remind uh, attendees that we still have a couple of minutes uh, before we end the webinar. Please feel free to send in your questions in the chat box, or just raise your hand if you're comfortable to, you know, unmute yourself and ask your question. So the next question is by Jero. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Jero, would you uh, wish to unmute yourself to ask your question? Oh, okay thank you very much um, for allowing me to 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 ask this question first of all i'm going to, uh, i i wish to thank uh, the presenter sometimes i find it difficult to pronounce the the names correctly or then I, i want to say it is a wonderful presentation it is definitely an inspiring uh, presentation i just want to make a, a comment about the difficulties she she went through and despite those challenges she is able to come up with something that is beneficial not only for people in in india but uh, for people all over the world i think that is quite amazing and then is quite uh, inspiring and um, the other thing i wanted to uh, uh, point it out is that uh, challenges are part of life so if you want to back down from challenges it's going to be you know difficult if not impossible for you to make any breakthrough and another important thing about challenges is the, that they make us stronger yeah you cannot make any growth without 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 challenges any challenge that you face is there to make you a bit more stronger so if you are facing challenges uh don't don't give up just continue just like uh, the speaker have mentioned she faced so many challenges and that did not stop her from from well, from from moving ahead so i must say um um my background is actually science chemistry in particular and then uh, when i saw this um you know advertisement that um, you know somebody is coming to make a presentation to show that what c is uh, you know the impact c is making i was actually you know interested so i decided to to comment so i want to say a wonderful thank you and definitely it's an inspiration for me you know <laughs> i'm actually a phd student at the moment at uh, at the university of of england uh, in the uk so thank you very much it is definitely you know an inspiring one and i wish 
all the Commonwealth scholars and any other person would see this and be inspired and then you know be motivated to do something wonderful like she is doing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the kindness, Jero. I hope I pronounced your name right. Uh, it means everything to me to just hear these really reinforcing words and I will definitely hold on to it. Thank you. I would echo the same, Jero. Thank you so much for your kind words. And um, it's really amazing to see that, you know, we have attendees from various fields attending the live session and being inspired, as I said. Thank you so much for sharing um, you know, your, your uh, thoughts on the presentation, Jero. Um, we do have a question from uh, one of our attendees in the chat box. I'm not sure if um, Dorothy D. Gabriella uh, would like to unmute. Okay, all right, no. It's fine. I will ask the, your questions for uh, for you to Kirti. So Dorothy has uh, mentioned, first of all, thank you so much for your response on men's participation. Um, but she'd also like to ask, what are the challenges you face in mainstreaming gender issues, bearing in mind the polarization of men and the dragging feet approach of policy makers? What are your thoughts on this, Kirti? Thank you so much for your question. And also thank you for touching upon an area that I may never stop speaking about. So if I'm going over time, Ms. Eva, you know what to do. <laughs> but um, one of the biggest challenges that I have faced is resistance really to engaging with me. Um, because like I mentioned earlier, wherever you go, whether it's a classroom or a workplace or a political institution or the government, you're always going to meet someone who has power and is not willing to distribute, share, or redistribute that power. So there is always going to be some piece of the system, some piece of the culture, some piece of the structure that is gonna vehemently oppose you. A second challenge that I've often faced is because of the way I look. So I'm considered to look younger than I actually am. I'm not gonna reveal my age on this call, but I'm supposed to, this is what I've been told. And I have a generally softer voice which is oftentimes very easy to drown out when I'm in a room full of men with booming voices. And that has happened very often. Sometimes I've been mistaken to be the intern. I've received orders for coffee and snacks. And when I refuse to go and get it, people have been wondering, hmm, where is this arrogant woman coming from? So I've faced multiple forms of this resistance, but I think the one thing I refuse to do is back down. But I want to acknowledge that I have the privilege that has opened the door into these rooms. And that privilege is something I want to strive to redistribute as much as I can by ceding space. But we're not necessarily in a world that is equal in terms of how it distributes privilege to people. So while I'm sharing with you challenges that I've faced, I know women in my community who face double these challenges because of the ways in which multiple identities they have intersect and make it impossible for them to have audience before a policymaker. I mean, of course it was my privilege, the fact that I am an upwardly mobile English speaking woman with a very comfortable internet connection uh, to be able to speak at the Security Council. But women in my community who don't speak English, who are facing violence every day, who don't have access to the internet, they are the voices we need to hear. And so that's where this learning and this understanding of how privilege works comes in handy. I know I just sort of meandered out of the frame of what your question asked, but every one of the forms of discrimination I've faced have also helped me introspect on how I'm perpetrating some of this discrimination myself and to really look inwards to see how I can dismantle pieces of that. Thank you, Kirti, for responding to the question. Um, we still have uh, a couple of minutes to go, so I don't want to lose out on the questions that are coming through. Um, the next we have uh, Fatu, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Apologies if not. Would you mind unmuting yourself to ask your question? Hi, Fatou, can you hear me? But do you want to unmute yourself to ask your question? Yes, uh, good afternoon. Good can afternoon. You me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, thank you very much, uh, presenter and organizers, for this uh, very interesting uh, piece of work. 
I really appreciate and salute uh, you. Um, and having gone through all these challenges and uh, you have actually succeeded. Congratulations. Having said that, I, I saw the, in, the, in the issues that you have been uh, dealing with, uh, the issue of uh, storytelling. Uh, I know storytelling is one of those very effective uh, communication um, between uh, especially adult and other peers. And I, I am I'm interested in knowing how you were able to um, uh, install those storytellings and what kind of stories we are being told and how we are you doing it actually. Uh, is it documented or do you have a, actually uh, uh, the storytelling in a booklet form for others to learn or do you have a, a link where we can find these stories so that we can also use it uh, in our in our day-to-day -day work. Thank you so much. Well done. Thank you so much for your comments and for your very generous uh, appreciation, which I really hold dear. Um, now, I want to say when I speak about storytelling, it is very oral history oriented, where people open up and talk about their stories and not necessarily write it down. And one of the policies that we followed was that nobody's stories would leave the room in which they were shared. Now, the reason we did this was because some of the stories were so intensely personal, so intensely challenging to put an identity to outside the frame of a confidential environment. So that's broadly why you may not see written pieces of the stories itself outside. But I'll give you my formula and how beautifully it can work for you really comes down to how you creatively change and work with it. So the first step is really an icebreaker. You get into the room, you do this really nice icebreaker activity, get people out of their inhibitions and have them really think about how they can trust you as well. So which means you also participate in the icebreaker. Now, this can be anything from sitting down and saying two truths and a lie, which is a fun game where you get everybody to tell two truths and a lie about themselves and the others have to guess which the lie is. Now, it's a really nice way to get to know very random facts about the people you're engaging with. So that's one thing I would do. And then the next is I would invite people to, to come in and share their stories by setting a few rules about how this is a safe, confidential, and non-judgmental space, and also offering resources for people to think through their triggers, which you might remember we started this session with. Now, when you do that, people begin to open up and share a story or two of their own, and that leads to a conversation. Now, sometimes some rooms are not necessarily open or willing to share their own stories, so I begin. I start by telling my story, but I don't get too much of the story out there because I don't want it to be about me. I would love for the session to be about people around themselves. Um, Ms. Eva, may I have your permission to take one more minute to share an example of how this worked? Of course, please go ahead. Yes. Thank you so much. So in a classroom, I was invited to, and this is one of my first workshops, the teacher told me that the children had a huge bullying problem. And there was this young man and a young woman in the class. The young man was constantly targeting the young woman, throwing her things out the window, shaking her up when she sat down on her chair and so much more. So we realized that the problem there was not going away when the boy was being made to speak to the teachers about what was going on and he wasn't opening up. So I went there, I played four or five icebreaker games, because you know how it is with children, they love games, and then they settle down when they're tired. So we got that out the way, and then I invited them to share stories. By the time we finished the fifth icebreaker, the young girl had found that she could trust me. Uh, she built her own trust with me because the activities were so willing to involve everyone in it, and they saw me participate like one of them. So this young woman steps up before the class and she says to everyone, look, I am so tired of being bullied because I'm so scared I might lose my things, he may beat me, I might feel pain. And then she began to cry and she said that in her own house, she was constantly dealing with violence like this because her father was beating her mother every day. And this little child would often insert herself between them so that her mother would not get the beatings. Now, this child had become so quiet and so silent because of all the violence she was facing at home. Now, the moment the boy heard this, he got up with a sudden force and pushed his chair back, marches up to the girl, and we were all pretty scared about what he was going to do. So I'm trying to stop the boy when he suddenly breaks down himself. And he says, I'm going through the exact same thing. My father beats my mother every day. And I'm pushing myself in between them so my mom doesn't get beaten. 
And now you see how the same reality is so shared, but it's produced two different outcomes. It's made a girl believe that violence is something she will deserve. And it's made a boy believe that violence is a way for him to have control over his life. But that moment, it was so beautiful. I did nothing. I did nothing. I just held space. But these two children came together in a way that I can't explain having seen anywhere else in the world. And today, the two of them continue to run these storytelling sessions on their own. So you see, the power of it is really just the people you work with and the love you sow the space with. Honestly, I mean, it's a very Harry Potter way of saying it. But at the end of the day, the answer is love. Thank you so much for sharing the response. And I do know we are running a little over time, but that's fine. Um, we do have a question based on you know what you just responded, and I appreciate if you have covered uh, your response in in you know uh, if you've covered this point in your response, that's completely fine. But the question is, what are the ethical dilemmas that you faced in the storytelling exercise? Yeah, well, that's that's a really interesting question. And I think it's something we always work through because uh, we're constantly occupying positions of privilege and power in our everyday lives. Now, when we're in a session, when we're in a, in a classroom, when we're in a workplace, we have a dominant position. And in that dominant position, we're also asserting pieces of our identity that could hurt another person, um, whether we know it, whether we think it, whether we actively choose to do it. So that's a huge ethical dilemma. And I'm always questioning my positionality. In fact, even, and I don't know, Miss Eva, if you remember this, in our first conversation, I, the first thing I was thinking of, I don't know if I'm the right person to do this. So it's a constant reflection process where you're really rethinking and thinking about how you land and why you land the way you land. Another ethical dilemma I've often faced is really just about how you, you have to stay silent when somebody who is dealing with such a difficult time does not want help. Um, you can never force a person to get help. It is so difficult, but it breaks your heart to walk away from a situation where somebody is evidently facing brutal violence, but is just not able to get out of that situation. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that response. And while we do have... Um... We do have a few attendees who have um, appreciated your webinar presentation and given words of uh, appreciation in the chat box. I do have one more question, which seems very interesting. If you do have the time, maybe we could uh, address this question. And for attendees who would like to um, leave the session, uh, due to time restraints, please. Um, thank you so much for attending. But if you'd like to wait for a couple of more minutes while Ketu responds us to this question, um, it would be lovely for, uh, for us to have you uh, for a couple of more minutes here. Uh, so Kirti, if you are okay with, uh, in terms of time, I would like to uh, raise this question. Um, the question is from Albert who is saying, first of all, thank you for an inspiring presentation. And it's just a question on communication. Do you work with the media? If yes, how do you work with them? And do you think of, for us starting new projects may need to consider working with the traditional media? How best can we do that? Well, thank you so much for your question, Albert. Um, I must confess that I don't have a deep body of work or a wide body of work with the media, except for two workshops that I did on peace journalism. Now, this is a concept that has been put together by some of the most amazing minds in the field of peace education and really calls upon the broader theme of looking at ways to tell truths, tell stories without allowing for sensationalism and propaganda. Now, peace journalism was a very tricky place for me to navigate because I neither have a degree in journalism nor experience in journalism. Now, how was I going to lead a class in this? So I kept my work just to the peace education context and brought in a journalist who was able to bring that synergy with journalism. So that's the background I'm gonna answer your question with. Now, engaging with the media, I think is fundamental because what the media is today is simply something nobody could have conceived of even as early as five years ago. The media has become our single most significant point of reference for information and for the news. And 
you're sort of in danger if the media has a vested interest in positioning certain items to you at the cost of certain other pieces of information that you should know. And we know historically there have been several of the world's wars that have been waged because of an information warfare starting it off. So it's important to acknowledge that media positionality is a significant actor in a world that we envision for peace. Another point to also deeply think about is recreating the idea or the role of the media in itself. We know that the media is the fourth estate. It is important. It is a very significant foot soldier in the future of the nation. But why don't we start by questioning media houses for how they produce information and present information? For example, we've seen so much about the racist reportage around the COVID-19 coverage. We've seen racist reportage around the Ukraine war, um, around the conflict that erupted at the end of the troop withdrawal in Afghanistan last year. And so many pieces of this have gone unquestioned and media houses are thriving on normalizing particular ways of engagement. Um, I don't know if this really answers your question, but my idea of engaging with the media is to really question what you receive and triangulate the information you receive so that it's verified in real. Amazing. And with this, I would like to end the Q&A session. I would have loved to uh, continue because there's so many wonderful uh, questions that we had received earlier in advance, but uh, unfortunately, I would now like to end the Q&A session. Thank you so much, Kirti, for responding wonderfully to all the questions that have come through in our Q&A session and for your brilliant, brilliant presentation on your work. Um, I would like to let the attendees know that we did have, uh, and especially for uh, attendees who have joined us a little later in the session, if you feel some of the information that Kirti shared was uh, sensitive and difficult or challenging to deal with, Kirti has very kindly shared a, a link to resources that you can um, uh, avail or access. Um, please do so. I am, yes, both of us have shared that link now in the chat box, but please feel free to have a look at the uh, information or label that Kirti has shared. Um, this webinar is also an opportunity for you. There's a question on networking through the webinar. So yes, this webinar or the platform is an opportunity for you to network with not just the speaker, but also with uh, the other attendees in this webinar. So please feel free to get in touch with each other uh, via LinkedIn, via the CSE's Knowledge Hubs. If you would like to get in touch with Kirti to ask any further questions or to discuss um, anything related to this webinar topic or in terms of her work in general, please feel free to get in touch with Kirti via her email address, which you can see on the screen, and also via LinkedIn. I am sharing the link to her LinkedIn profile in the chat box. Um, so, yes, yeah. so thank you so much to all the attendees for joining this webinar. I hope you have all found this webinar useful and have learned something about uh, Kirti's journey and Kirti's uh, career within the gender and um, uh, peace space. Um, we would like to let you know that this webinar is recorded. We will be sharing the recording on CSE's YouTube channel and also on CSE's Knowledge Hub. So please use, um, please go to the uh, go to the CSE's YouTube channel to access the webinar recording, and also get in touch with Kirti if you would like to ask any further questions. Kirti, any final words uh, to summarize your webinar? Well, just deep gratitude to each of you for giving me an hour and then some more of your lives and just give me the opportunity to get to know you. I would love to hear from any of you who would like to stay in touch. If you think we can work together, those doors are always open. So thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much for 